bless your name, O oh God. I glorify your name, O oh God. I lift up hands before you, O oh God. Hallelujah. I surrender all to you, Father. I bless your name, O oh God. Oh, I surrender to you for the leading, Lord God. I surrender to you, Lord God, for your guidance, O oh God. Where he could find a place. 
And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he had journeyed. And Micah said unto him, What's coming thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel in thy victuals. So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons, and Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. You may be seated in the house of the Lord as I minister to you this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me minister to you guys on this morning something that the Lord dropped into my spirit many years ago. It has been brewed in my spirit for many years, many years, many years. It was a number of years ago. When I first read this scripture some years ago, I was appalled by this blatant violation of the first of the Ten Commandments, that thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. And what really bothered me about this, the more I studied this, I realized that these characters who were involved were actually Jews that were involved. These were Jews that were involved in this false worship in this violation of the first commandment of God Almighty. These were Jews. And then I, I was even more appalled the more I studied this. If you study the timeline, you'll realize, you'll realize that perhaps they had submitted to this false worship before Joshua's final chapter had ended. Before his final chapter had ended, they had submitted to this false worship. They began to compromise before the final chapter, whereas Joshua spoke the words that he told them. They had compromised. My God. They had compromised before Joshua even spoke the words, saying, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, obviously something made him say that, and this was probably part of what made him say this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I say the same thing to you. You do you if you want to do you, and you do what you will, but as for me and my house, my God, my God, as for me and my pastorship, as for me and who I am in the Lord, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord, these Jewish people, my God. They were Jewish. They were Jewish. So I minister you a warning on today, a warning because of the tendency of people to disregard what God has done for them. And for those who in their mind do not regard the warnings of being aware of false worship. But a, a few months ago, I embarked on what I thought was a finished series, thought, something I thought that I was completely done with, I began to talk about a series called The Danger Of. That series includes the danger of leaven, and it also includes the danger of complacency, which respectfully is being puffed up, and the opposite of not being puffed up enough. On this morning, I minister to you the danger of false worship. The danger of false worship. The danger of false worship. You may not think that you're worshiping something just because it's not a gold idol, because it's not a wooden idol. You may not think that you're worshiping something, but whatever you give the most of your attention to, give the most of your passion to, that is your God. In this story above, in this story above, we see an abominable act, an abominable act, an act which should make all of us angry. The act of making their own God. This family in Israel had set up false worship. They made their own God. They made their own God, the worship of an idol. And in this small act, in terms of one family doing so, they set up two tribes and eventually the nation of Israel for generations to come, they were set up in false worship. I saw some things that really jumped out to me in the story. About four or five things. Let me talk about them. First, it's clear, and we should know this, that worship an idol stands in opposition to God's word. It stands in total opposition. The first of the commandments read, you should have no God before me. So making their own God, not even as a false representation, but to try to take his glory and to place his glory into what God calls a dumb idol, a dumb piece of wood, something that he has made. The word tells us clearly to be careful not to worship the creation, but to worship the creator. So the first thing is a violation of the Ten Commandments, which was so obvious. 
The second thing was external religious actions are not enough. Faith in the true God is required. Why else would he say that those who worship God must worship him in the pluralistic action of spirit and in truth? Uh -huh. not, not it didn't say in spirit or truth. It didn't say spirit or truth. It did not give you a choice. You must worship him in spirit and in truth. You must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is a pluralistic or a duplicate action that you must take. But to be a true worshiper of God, both elements must be together and intact. It is a reciprocal in nature, meaning one feeds off the other. Without spirit, you do not accept truth, and without truth, you will not accept spirit. Now, the man of Michael was a jealous man. He was a zealous man. He thought that he could build his own religion. He built a temple unto God, his own God. He commissioned his own priest, and then he began religious services based on the opposite of true worship. He had a spirit, but he was worshiping God. He had spirit, but he was serving the lie. So spirit and lie is indicative of the deception of one who is the liar. In his misguided attempt to be his own man, he even hired a false priest. Huh? One who would say what he wanted to say, do what he wanted done. In essence, he had hired a puppet and he, a puppet, puppet, and he began pulling the strings. So Micah, Micah had strong deception. And in his strong deceit, he thought that the one true God would bless him. Huh? He was treating God like a genie. He thought the one true God would bless him by bringing and setting up idols. Huh? My God. He said these words. He said, now I know the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. Now, if you look at the words, you can almost speculate that he was not being blessed after he set up his own son as his priest. So when he did was he went out and he found himself a homeless man. Huh? He thought he had struck a chord with God because he had found himself a homeless Levite to help him worship God. Oh, we'll get back to that. Third thing. False beliefs lead to false teachings. False beliefs lead to false teaching. And the thing about God, if you choose to believe the lie because it doesn't fit your small view of how God should be, you choose to limit God from being sovereign. When you choose to believe the lie, God will help you believe the lie. Second Thessalonians 2 says that God sends strong delusions to those who think that they're right. In other words, they get caught up in a reprobate mind. They think that they're right. They think that what they're doing is right and what everyone else is doing wrong. Oh, my God. They think that because someone else is telling them that they're, that they're living a lie, that they're doing something that's contrary to God. They think because they want to be who they want to be. They want to be themselves. Oh, my God. So they find believing that lie. That's why it says to be very careful. You can convince yourself you're a bird if you think about it long enough. You'll find yourself a building to jump off of because you think that you're a bird. My God, my God. Your self-righteousness becomes your own righteousness and your dreams of being something that you're not becomes your own reality. Now false worship is a very contagious thing. And those who were rebellious in the first place fall victim to false belief. And false belief becomes false teachings and becomes false worship. Uh -huh. When the people of the tribe of Dan inquired concerning the place to settle, this was after the priest, the so-called Levite priest, had been set up. They passed by and they happened to see that a Levite was supposedly in place as the priest of the land. So they came into Micah's house and the priest of Micah, the priest of Michael, amen, look up here, not that there, amen. The priest of Micah told him, go on, go do. Go on, go get the land. God has promised this. You, you can go on, go get this land. But the thing was, they went to a place where God had told them not to go. And their journey resulted in a peaceful village being destroyed. And the Danites were cursed because of the destruction of the peaceful village. Fourth thing. Sinful actions by one person can have a long-term impact. Come on now, we know this now. This, this should be easy to us. The story of Adam and Eve. By the sins of Adam has mankind been cursed. 
Huh? The sins of Adam has caused mankind to go through what mankind is going through. Right. Huh? The closing verse of this account leaves us with these words. The Danites set up for themselves the idol. And Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were the priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. Uh -huh. Did you hear that? It started early on during the time that Joshua was still alive, went through the time of the judges up until the point where the northern kingdoms were taken into captivity. My God. So Micah's gods led to false worship not only among us, an entire tribe or two of Israel, but it was the influence for the false worship in the northern kingdom up until the time of the captivity. We may not think that our sinful actions hurt others, but they do. They can have a long-term negative impact on entire communities for years to come. We may not think that what we have done, oh my God, will affect our children, but why is it that the word tells us to renounce the sins of our fathers, my God? Because there are some things that we can do that can cause our children to suffer for generations to come. I shouldn't have to pull it up in the Bible and show you that it says that generations are cursed by what someone else did years ago. This situation was something, you know. It was really a one bad decision after another. As I told you before, an amazing truth is that the family here, perhaps even the mother, knew Joshua and was one of the ones who was there because she was of the age to have crossed the Jordan with Joshua and perhaps she had a front row seat at Shechem when Joshua called all the tribes together and said these words, you cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after that he had done you good. This was crazy decision. But let's look at this decision. The decisions began when Michael decided in his heart to steal from his mother. What man steals from his mother? What child steals from his mother? Huh? The Old Testament had provisions that said that if you stole in order to eat, you were supposed to add 5% to it. But there's nothing in there that says that he added a fifth to what he had stolen. But there's nothing that indicates that he had done anything such as add a fifth. And what motivated him even to return the 1,100 pieces of silver? If you really read the story, it wasn't because he was trying to do what was right. It was because he was scared. It was because he was afraid of the curses that his mother had spoken upon whoever had stole the silver. Huh? It wasn't out of guilt. It wasn't out of, Lord, I have done wrong before you. I have wronged my mother. It was because he was a scared cat. So it wasn't fear that motivated him. It wasn't fear of the Lord that motivated Micah to confess his sins and restore the money. It was his mother. He was not broken over his sin. In other words, it was the shame that was there. He wasn't broken over his sin, but he was scared of being caught by the curses that came upon him. But look at this. After Michael returned the money, his mother tries to turn the curses into blessings. And instead of disciplining her son, she appeases him. She rewarded his bad behavior. Oh. Come on now, that's a very dangerous child rearing practice that's practiced real good today. It's real prevalent today. We reward the bad behaviors of our children. Huh? We, we, we condone their bad behavior. There was a time when we got in trouble at school. Sister Sims, our parents joined in with the teacher and they stood in line to use the paddle at school. But nowadays, if a teacher corrects a child, she may have to fight somebody in the parking lot. And you wonder why they come to school only to get a paycheck. You wonder why it's not a passion anymore. You wonder why it's just merely a way to make ends meet anymore. Because they realize the way that parents are. They, my God, 